much for coming. Uh, this is the first time we've tried to do this, so uh, we can hopefully keep building on it from here. Um, we asked Luke to be the first speaker um, in this series because of the fact that not only did Luke do his undergrad here, he was also the president of the Maxwell Society, and Ooh. it's something that he has championed for years, but just it's never, uh, the Maxwell Society have never been able to get it off the ground to get to a point where we have these talks where we get PhDs to give some information to us undergrads about what's actually happening at King's. So I'm really happy that Luke's agreed to do this today, so please welcome Luke Nichols. Thank you very much. Uh, so yeah, I'm Luke Nichols and I'm a PhD student here at King's, and uh, it's a great honour to give this first of uh, the King's Talks uh, lecture series, and I'm sure throughout the uh, year you'll see some other interesting talks from PhD students in the college. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about my research, which in broad terms is about controlling light with light. So uh, using one pulse of light to change the optical properties of a material, which in turn affects the propagation and the properties of a different light wave. And specifically, I'm going to talk about changing polarization of light uh, using this scheme, controlling light with light, uh, through metamaterials, which is something I will talk about later. So, I thought I'd give you a bit of a background of, of me and how I got here, standing here today. So, I started my undergraduate career at Imperial College, uh, where I started studying a degree in chemical engineering. And so, I did this, and by the end of the year, I was wholly certain that this was the most boring thing ever. <laughs> I mean, it was literally dire. So I thought I'd do anything to get out and do something more interesting than this. So I decided to work for a year in insurance, which was <laughs> unbelievably more interesting than chemical engineering. Uh, but then by the end of that year, I also thought, this is quite dumb, uh, maybe I'll rekindle my student days again. So I enrolled at King's College London uh, in 2010 now, and this is me on my induction day in uh, 2010. And it's still my card photo now, so I've still got it. Um, but not content with four years of a master's degree here, I decided to carry on and do my PhD. So now I've been here for seven years, and I'll leave you to uh, I'll leave you to make up your own mind whether seven years at King's has, has had a positive or negative effect. <laughs> so. Uh, I'm doing my PhD here at King's, and it's in the Photonics and Nanotechnology group. This is a new group, so we had experimental biophysics and nanotechnology before, and this split, and one of the groups that came off of experimental biophysics is this Photonics and Nanotechnology group. And what it concerns is the uh, study of novel materials to solve uh, problems in technology, uh, and specifically problems with technology concerning light. Um, and head of this group, who is actually my supervisor, is uh, Professor Anatoly Zayas. And some faces that you might know that I work with closely are Dr. Wayne Dixon. Uh, he teaches the third year optics course. And uh, Dr. Francisco Rodriguez Fortunio, uh, also known as Paco, uh, who teaches second year labs. And they actually, if you're interested in this talk, they all teach a module next semester uh, called Advanced Photonics that goes into some uh, details about the, the wider area. So you can all take that and uh, give them some more work to do next term. <laughs> and so what I was telling tell you about was this group. So this is, the, this is us all here, having a group photo. We all work in looking at new materials, novel materials, to create interesting optical effects. And one class of these materials is called metamaterials. So, in a naturally occurring material, the response of that material to an optical uh, wave, an electric, electromagnetic field, is uh, given by a collection of atoms. <coughs> Individual responses of the atoms make up the response of the material as a whole. So, if we uh, look inside our material, we have lots of atoms, they all have electron gas cloud around them. And then if we apply an electric field, they all respond to this uh, electric field by redistributing their electrons. So this is uh, known as the polarizability of your material. 
and this gives you your optical response. Now, similar to naturally occurring materials, what we can do is we can make something called a metamaterial. And what we do here is that instead of uh, atoms being our individual elements, we construct these uh, man-made meta-atoms as our individual elements, where we design the geometry, and they're made of different uh, naturally occurring materials. And because they're sub-wavelength elements, they also have the same uh, sort of response to natural materials in that the response of that material can be described by an effective, effective optical properties like refractive index, permittivity, um, which is governed by the individual meta atoms and the collection of them as a whole. So if we look inside uh, our meta material, so in this meta material, We've got uh, our individual meta atoms are these uh, metal wires, <coughs> all right? And if we apply an oscillating electric field, their uh, electrons respond to this electric field, and this is this response is given by the geometry that we design in these meta materials. We can design them uh, such that their response gives interesting optical properties, and sometimes optical properties that we don't see in nature. So one of these uh, optical properties that we can design is a uh, negative refractive index. So uh, we all know about uh, refraction, so we did this in school basically. So this is uh, Snell's law. So if we illuminate uh, with light from going from uh, a refractive index um, a less, den a less dense medium, so a lower refractive index to a higher refractive index, so a more dense medium, the light wave bends towards the normal. So we all know this, right? But what if now, instead of uh, going from a positive refractive index to a positive refractive index, we go to a negative refractive index, we get a, a curious effect in that the refraction occurs on the same side of the normal. So where it just bent towards the normal and carried on along, now it bends towards the same side of the normal. And also there's another curious <coughs> thing that you, you'll be able to see in this, uh, this simulation. So although the energy is still being propagated in the uh, forward direction, the phase velocity, so this is the speed um, that the uh, waves are traveling uh, in the medium, is actually traveling in the opposite direction to what we had before. And uh, it's this fact that can be used to make uh, some, well, it's this fact and this curious bending that we can use in several applications. So some applications that people come up with when we, when we first um, found out about this class of materials, uh, so a lot of this work was done in the in the early 2000s, but you can see that someone postulated this negative index back in 1968, but it took all that time uh, for people to actually come up with applications and to build um, uh, working structures. Uh, so one application that came out of this is a so-called super lens. And so if you think about an, a material, our metamaterial, that has a negative refractive index, say minus one, and goes from air, which has a refractive index of one, you see that an object that emits uh, rays, when it uh, goes into the negative index material, uh, bends, and, and it bends such that it, it, it looks as though it reflects off the normal of the, of the interface. Uh, it, these rays will then be focused inside the metamaterial, and then if you uh, design your metamaterial thickness, Right, you can create an image on the other side of your meta material. So you use this negative index material to create a lens. And due to this uh, backwards propagation, way the, the backwards phase velocity, uh, this actually creates a super resolution image. So it beats the diffraction limit of, uh, of imaging, which is in conventional lenses. So in conventional lenses, uh, 
your uh, resolution is limited to about the wavelength of the light that you're using. And this is because that higher frequencies, so uh, lower wavelengths of light, uh, there are losses associated with these, which is due to an evanescently decaying field. But when you've got this backward, propag uh, backward phase velocity, this uh, decaying uh, information actually becomes a, uh, a, a growing, growing uh, wave. So not evanescent, evanescent decaying, but actually evanescently uh, actually growing. So in this paper here, which is uh, was done in science in 2005, uh, they were able to image a sub wavelength uh, word, so nano, which they picked, obviously, and with this super lens to create uh, a perfect image on the other side, which is below the diffraction limit of, of conventional lenses. So lensing is one application. But also with this curious bending of light, some people thought, well, if we can do these uh, funny things where we can bend light wherever we like. If I now make a material where I put an object inside this material, and what this material does is it bends the light uh, around that object and then recombines the beam and goes out the other side as if, uh, as if it had been unaltered and just gone straight through, you won't be able to see that object. So this is, uh, this is an actual cloak. So this is an invisibility cloak, so this is something that you may have, may have heard about, that metamaterials are, are a big driver of, of creating cloaks. Um, and there are all sorts of cloaks, optical cloaks, acoustic cloaks. Uh, even we were discussing before, there's uh, earthquake cloaks where they make the metamaterial by drilling holes around a uh, power plant so that uh, it's protected against earthquakes. And what it does is it bends the uh, earthquake waves uh, around the site, and then so the site is unaffected, and then you can just focus them somewhere else on some town that you don't care about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so cloaks. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about is how we use metamaterials to control polarization. So I thought I'd recap slightly what polarization actually is. So uh, in this room, from these lights, we actually have un unpolarized light. And then if you and the way to get it polarized is you use a polarizer, a polarizing filter. So we can put a polarizing filter, and then we've got light of one polarization orientated along the axis of the polarizer. So if you have polarized light, the way you know it's polarized is by using another polarizer. And then if you cross polarize them, you get uh, no light passing through. So that's when you've got perfectly polarized light. There's no light coming out when you cross polarize two polarizers. It's perfectly polarized. So we have different types of polarization. We have linear polarization. I'm going to go through two main types. Linear polarization, uh, which we can have in any orientation, so we can have vertical, horizontal, which you just saw, um, or any angle in between, obviously. Uh, but also, what we can do is have uh, elliptical polarization. And these occur when you uh, put one component of the electric field out of phase with uh, the other component. So you get a rotating field as it propagates. So, so you get a spiral-like uh, electric field as it travels. But why do we care about polarization? So polarization is really a defining property of a, of a wave and is used in lots of applications from in the lab to actual everyday technology. So uh, in the lab, it's used in microscopy and chemical analysis, so you can uh, differentiate between different chemicals by the way that they act, react to different uh, uh, polarization states. And then in technology, uh, for example, in optical communications, where you can encode information in perpendicular uh, polarization states. So the way that we uh, control polarization, so you've got polarization of one state that I've just shown, and then, but you want to change that polarization state to something else. What we generally use is these things called wavelengths. And what these do is they're made of uh, something called an anisotropic material, optical material, and they have 
uh, what that means is they have uh, different transmission components for uh, what we call an extraordinary wave, which is uh, one uh, axis of the material, and the ordinary wave, which is the uh, perpendicular uh, axis. And this difference between the transmission uh, is such that it creates a phase difference between these two, these two uh, perpendicular components of the polarization. So we have an incoming field, and then the outgoing field is, is changed by these transmission coefficients that we have here. So in a half-wave plate, uh, what this does is it retards. So if we have this polarization state coming in here, and our um, wave plate is orientated along this extraordinary axis here. What it does is it will retard the uh, extraordinary part of the polarization by, uh, by a phase difference of pi. So if you look now, the extraordinary wave is pi out of phase, and when that's down, that's up, and when that's up, that's down. Whereas in the ordinary wave, is uh, unaffected by, by any phase difference. So what we've done by introducing the phase difference with this anisotropic material is we converted one polarization state to its orthogonal state. And then with a quarter wave plate, what this does is it introduces a uh, pi over two phase difference between uh, between the two components. So what? So we have our wave that we had before, and then we introduce a pi over two phase difference between to the extraordinary wave, to the transmitted extraordinary wave, and what we get is one of these rotating fields. And in a special case of elliptical polarization, we can have circular polarization. And these, this can have different handedness, so this one's spinning anti-clockwise, but you can also, by changing the orientation with the wave plate, can, uh, control the handedness and then it will spin uh, clockwise. So these uh, wave plates, though, are macroscopic things. So uh, they're about half a centimeter thick, say. So obviously, this is no good for nanotechnology if you want to uh, change your polarization uh, state in a, a nano device or something like that on chip. So a lot of work's been done using metamaterials in order to try and control the polarization in a thinner. Um, in a thinner material, so creating strongly anisotropic materials, because this is weakly anisotropic, so that means that you need a long uh, working distance for it to convert polarization, but we want to do this in a, in a very small space. So uh, different metal materials have been constructed. Uh, this is a chiral material, so it has a handedness itself, so we can, so we can interact with um, this circular polarization state that we saw before. Uh, but the one I want to focus on is uh, this metal material here, which is an array of nanorods. Uh, so they're an array of standing rods, metallic rods, uh, which we make here in the, in the group uh, at King's. And it was shown in this paper here that we can uh, design this metal material to do the same thing as those wave plates that we saw before. But this interaction happens. This length here, the nanorods, is only about a few hundred nanometers. So we've gone from centimeters right the way down to nanometers. So the way we make this metamaterial is, uh, is by a uh, self-assembly process. So we have, you can't really see the aluminum here, but we have a glass substrate. We start to some gold on that substrate, which is going to be uh, an uh, electrical contact and an aluminum layer. Then by a process called anodization, we change this aluminium layer into alumina, which is aluminium oxide. Uh, and in this process, you create pores, so holes in this material. Then, by uh, creating electrical contact with the gold underlayer and dipping this in a gold solution, and you apply an electric field, you can electrically deposit uh, gold into these holes. So you get nanorods standing up in these holes. So you can get rid of this template and then you've got gold nanorods standing on a substrate. So this is a scanner electron microscope image of, of this metal material. So here this 
white bar here is 100 nanometers, so that's the sort of scale that we're talking about. And you get an idea of the sort of parameters that we're talking about. An important point with this uh, fabrication process is that we can make very large area uh, metamaterials. A lot of fabrication processes are what we call uh, write, writing processes, so like electron beam lithography. So you, you, you go to your uh, electron beam lithographer, lithography machine, and you literally write each individual metamaterial at one end. This happens all at the same time, all in one go, so everything uh, can be done over very, very much larger areas for the tech same uh, fabrication time. But why do we care about this particular metamaterial for polarization? So I said to you before that what we want to control polarization is an anisotropic material. And it turns out that the nanoids are a strongly anisotropic material. So uh, here I have the permittivities, which are related to the refractive index of the material by uh, the square root of the permittivity. And uh, our permittivity of our nanoids can be described by two uh, components. So there is one refractive index, one permittivity that uh, is uh, present along this nanorod axis, and one that is in the xy plane. So you have one along the nanorod axis, and then one in plane of the nanorod axis. So our permittivity is now uh, a tensor because it affects um, different components of the polarization in different ways. So any component in the xy plane is affected by one permittivity, and uh, the perpendicular uh, direction is affected by another one. And we can see the difference between these two uh, optical responses uh, in the transmission coefficient, which I've got here, of the ordinary, which is this xy plane, and the extraordinary. So there's a large difference in this wavelength range between the ordinary and the extraordinary way. So, so far what I've talked to you about is this material that's anisotropic and can uh, change your polarization state of light. Uh, but the way, the way to then actively change, so if you've got your material there and you change from mm -hmm. diagonal into the perpendicular diagonal, but then you don't want that one afterwards, you want uh, to only rotate it, not by 90 degrees, by 45 degrees or something like that. The way you do that is you just mechanically twist your uh, uh, anisotropic crystal. But obviously that isn't very fast and, uh, and can be improved upon. So people have, so the way that we actively change the polarization state at the moment is using these things called Faraday rotators and popular cells. So these use uh, electromagnetic fields in order to change the anisotropy of a naturally occurring crystal, so there's a naturally occurring crystal here, one in this little box here. And by applying a field, you can change the anisotropy of your material and so change the amount by which the polarization is affected. And these uh, devices, uh, their fastest switching rates are of the order of gigahertz. The best is about 40 gigahertz. So we're talking about switching polarization every uh, nanosecond or so. So, but these are also macroscopic devices, like our um, wave plate. They, you know, you can hold them in your hand. So we want to. So these are no good for the nanoscale again and nano devices. So a lot of work has been done to try and shrink, uh, change these changeable active wave plates devices to the nanoscale, and. People have used a lot of different uh, stimulus for these changes, so uh, so providing a temperature change to change the conductivity of one of these metamaterials, which induces a polarization change. Uh, electrically, as in, which works much the same way as the uh, popular cells and Faraday rotates, what the popular cells, which has an electric field. And my favorite is this mechanical metamaterial, which is a uh, a spring, a metal spring material that has a specific handedness, and by uh, applying an acoustic signal, you can deform this spring to change its handedness from uh, one sense to the other, and so you can change the polarization on, on propagation through this. But 
as you'll appreciate, thermal and mechanical aren't very fast processes, uh, so won't improve on the speed, but at least we're down to the nanoscale. And electrically doesn't really give us anything more than what we've already got in terms of speed. So if we want to not only shrink these devices but make them faster, there is one other uh, stimulus that we can look at, is this all optical uh, modulation. So we're changing light, changing the material with light itself, and then, the, then changing the propagation of light through that material. And to understand how we can change uh, the properties of the material, we have to understand nonlinear optics. So in linear optics, uh, the um, response of a material, so this is the polarizability of your material, um, is linearly dependent on the field. So in everyday life, optics is fine with this. But uh, actually, the polarizability has higher order terms in the electric field. And the reason that we don't see these usually is that these coefficients here are very, very small. So you have to get very high amplitude fields in order for these effects to start coming into play. So if we look at second order of, um, term in this equation, these give rise to so-called wave mixing um, nonlinearities. So if we look at this term, we have an electric field which is two waves uh, of different frequencies coming onto your material. What happens when you solve this equation is that you get waves generated which have different frequencies. So in this term here, we've got a wave generated that oscillates at twice the frequency of, of, of omega-1. And this is so-called uh, second harmonic generation. So in this picture here, we isn't very well seen. Well, you wouldn't be able to see the 800 nanometer light anyway, so that's fine. So uh, 800 nanometer light is incident on this crystal. This is then frequency doubled, and then you get 400 nanometer to light out the other side. So you have this specific nonlinear crystal that, that enhances this effect so that you can double, frequency double your light. And then we also get uh, different processes where we add to uh, different few, uh, uh, frequencies or we get the difference. And so these processes are useful if you want to generate different frequencies of light. So where um, we are bound by the fact that we've only got a certain amount of sources that uh, emit at specific frequencies. So if you need laser light of uh, a particular frequency that you don't have a source for, you can use these processes to convert the existing sources to useful wavelengths. But then what we're interested in is this third order nonlinearity term for, for what I'm doing today, what I'm going to discuss with you. Uh, this also gives rise to wave mixing processes, but we're not going to worry about them. Uh, but it also has this thing called Kerr nonlinearity. And what it boils down to is that uh, you can affect the refractive index of your material by playing with the intensity of the incident line. So uh, by increasing your amplitude of your electric field, you can change the refractive index of the material actively. So we can understand this uh, as the uh, permittivity which gives us our refractive index. Our permittivity uh, is intimately linked with the geometry of our system, but also the state that are of the material that composes those metamatics. And obviously, you can change the state of the, the, the material that composes the metamatics by changing the energy of uh, the electrons in that system. So uh, we can uh, describe the electrons of a metal as an electron gas around, around the, uh, the metal. And so because it's a gas, we can associate a temperature with this gas, which is an electron temperature here. So our permittivity is a function of the energy of our electrons, which we can describe with a temperature of this electron. And so if we, uh, so yes, so here I plot the um, uh, permittivity of our nanorods. So remember we have this uh, same permittivity in the x and y directions, but uh, different permittivity in the z directions 
other than the power of axis. So I've got here the x component, so the xy component, and the z component. And we'll notice that they have very different values, so we can already see that they have very different, there is an isotropic material. But it has this crossing point here, which uh, actually changes the sign of the um, permittivity. So uh, above and below uh, this point, which we call epsilon near zero, uh, the optical properties, the optical response of the system is very different. So positive uh, permittivities, permittivities uh, suggest uh, dielectric-like behavior, and uh, negative permittivities suggest metallic-like behavior. So in order to change this permittivity, what we're going to do is we're going to put some energy into the system. And the way we do this is with a control pulse of light. So we hit our nanorods <laughs> with this control pulse of light. This heats the electron gas and uh, imparts energy. So this increases the electron temperature, which I'm going to do now. So if I increase the electron temperature, the permittivity actually changes. So from the dashed line there, which was our permittivity at room temperature electrons, we increase this temperature uh, to say 1,000 Kelvin, um, and the permittivity shift. But most importantly, this crossing point shifts. So this, uh, this point of uh, great change of optical properties is shifting from wavelength, which is going to be important later. Um, so these electrons get hot, and this happens at a time scale of about 100 femtoseconds. So we have to illuminate this with a very short pulse. So we illuminate it with a 50 femtosecond pulse. And it dumps all of the energy into the system, and the electron temperature uh, thermalizes in about 100 femtoseconds. Then, after the pulse has left, the electrons can relax this energy to uh, phonons. And uh, so there's a phonon bath and uh, this energy then is relaxed and then the permittivity changes back to the ground state. It's going to get cold now. Yes. Cold. And that relaxation process takes about 10 picoseconds. So femtosecond is, is 10 to the minus 15 seconds, picoseconds is 10 to the minus 12. So we can, cha we can change the properties of our material with a pulse of light. We're happy with that. But how do we control the polarization? So uh, this is a, a very simplified version of my experiment. Basically, what I'm doing is I have two pulses. One I call the control pulse, and one I call the signal pulse. So this signal pulse uh, has a certain polarization state. It goes through our metamaterial and interacts with this anisotropy and comes out with a linear diagonal polarization. Let's just say that. It's just a certain polarization state that goes through this metamaterial, and the output is this linear diagonal, which we can see in this bottom right hand corner. And I have a second pulse, which is called the control, which is going to control our uh, optical properties of our system. And they're separated by a delay in time. So at the moment, the control pulse is behind the signal pulse and isn't affecting uh, the signal. And then here I've got uh, an idealized metamaterial where uh, the ordinary wave of transmission, the transmission of the ordinary wave has a very flat response, whereas this extraordinary wave goes through this resonance. And uh, everyone knows about resonances because you've been studying them since year one. If uh, you have a resonance uh, and you go from lower frequencies uh, if you go from lower frequencies to higher frequencies, or lower wavelengths to higher wavelengths, there is a pi phase change uh, of the signal as you go through that resonance. So as we go through the resonance, we go from one phase state to another phase state, which is pi out of phase with, uh, with the lower wavelengths. Whereas for the ordinary wave, which has flat transmission, there's no changes in phase with wavelength. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, bring our control pulse to hit the metamaterial at the same time as our signal. And we see that 
what happens is well, what happens is that the resonance in the top right uh, shifts to longer wavelengths, and if we look at the phase, if we look at this dashed line, so this dashed line indicates the wavelength of this signal pulse. So if we look at the dashed line here, uh, we see that the phase of one component, the extraordinary component of this signal pulse, changes by pi on excitation by the control pulse, whereas for the ordinary wave, no phase change occurs. And as I said earlier, this is exactly what happens with a half wave. Plane. What happens is uh, it, the extraordinary wave gets a, uh, a pi phase delay uh, compared to the other um, the uh, ordinary component, and this changes our polarization by 90 degrees. So we've changed the polarization here. So this dash line is our original. This is our um, polarization with the control poles, and then as we increase the delay time between the control and signal, the uh, electrons get rid of all of their energy, and the system returns to the ground state, and we get back our original polarization. And as I said, this happens at about 100 femtoseconds to move this uh, red, red to move this resonance to the right, and then about 10 picoseconds to move, to the, move back to the ground state. So these are actually experimental results. So here I plot the uh, here I plot the uh, color maps of the extraordinary transmission and the ordinary transmission of my metamaterial. So on the x-axis we have wavelength. On the y-axis we have this delay time between the control and signal pulse. And the color map is basically the amplitude of the transmission. So for the ordinary wave we see uh, a flat transmission, there's, no, there's not really much uh, difference between the transmission uh, spectrally across this range. Whereas for the ordinary component, we can see that it goes from higher transmission down to lower transmission through this resonance and then starts to come back up again. This is this bit if we look at an, an X in the X plane. So if we change the different delay times, so this zero indicates when the pulses are overlapped. We see that this resonance shifts to longer wavelengths. And then as we increase the delay time, it comes back to the uh, original state. Whereas the ordinary wave, at this overlap time, we don't see any difference between, between the two um, states. So in order to recover the polarization of the signal wave, which we indicate as this, this, this dash line at 700, uh, is that we measure four components of the, the, the output signal. So we measure this um, co-polarized, which is blue, so this is orientated with this uh, dashed ellipse here, which was the original polarization state of the measurement of the signal. Uh, we do cross-polarized, which is this red dash line, uh, the ordinary wave, which is the purple, and the extraordinary wave, which is the orange. And by measuring the amplitude, uh, the intensity of these signals with delay time, we can reconstruct a polarization ellipse at each point of the experiment. So here we see that the ground state was this dash line, and then uh, this color map indicates the, the time. So at overlap time, zero picoseconds, it changes to this red ellipse, and then gradually from yellow to blue, from yellow to green to blue, goes back to the ground state in about 16 seconds. So this was done in different wavelengths, so we see the strongest effect is at this point where we see the resonance shift uh, past it, but we can see um, at different wavelengths, we also see rotation of the polarization ellipse from this blue dashed line to the red line and then back and then relaxing back as the electrons lose their energy. And we see that we can achieve with this 700 nanometer signal a rotation of the polarization ellipse. So this is just the, the orientation of that ellipse as it changes um, from its ground state to, to about 60 degrees. So we're quite near this sort of 90 degree rotation. And then 
we see by time as this orientation of the ellipse relaxes back down to, to zero. And these are plotting the, the different signal vertex. But also, what we did in this experiment is actually say, well, let's not consider the control pulse, let's just consider the polarization, uh, the, the effect on, of the intensity of the signal on its own polarization state. Because if you can increase the intensity of the signal enough, uh, will it be able to heat those electrons and as it's going through the metamaterial affect its own polarization state? And indeed, that is the case. So if we have our signal, some polarization state that we uh, have as a linear diagonal on the output. So the experiment is this gray line is very low power. And if all we do is increase the intensity of this uh, signal, we can start to rotate this polarization ellipse uh, through about uh, 60 degrees. So about as strong an effect as with the, with the control pulse as well. So now we can consider the fact that we can, with this metamaterial, we can um, change the polarization state of a single pulse just by increasing or decreasing its, its amplitude, its intensity. So I know I've gone for a lot, but I'm going to summarize and hopefully there's time for questions at the end. Um, so we, we combined this. Uh, so basically, by designing this metamaterial, we've combined the fact that we can we have a strong anisotropy of the material that we can control with this strong nonlinearity, uh, and so create a material that we can turn the polarization uh, on and off from two different states uh, with optical control. And as I went through before, the advantages of this is that. We can do this over subwavelength thicknesses. So instead of having a macroscopic device, we can now do this at the nanoscale, uh, a few hundred nanometer thick sample. And now the rates that we were talking about now, instead of being 20 gigahertz, are now 0.3 terahertz. And so we're looking at ways of increasing that rate even further by understanding the relaxation processes of the metamaterial. And as I said, touched on before, this metamaterial uh, can be fabricated uh, over large areas and um, lends itself to, uh, I don't know, uh, mass production facilities because it's it's not a right it's not a right procedure. It's a it's a parallel procedure, if you like. Um, so I think I've talked for long enough. So uh, I'll thank. Uh, UPSRC for giving me the money to study this for three, three and a bit years. Uh, this is our project where we get a lot of money from and buy lots of fancy lasers and equipment. And I'd like to thank you all for listening. If you uh, if you find it interesting, we recently published a paper on this uh, in Nature Photonics, uh, so you can read that and uh, 